kurun. Good afternoon, everyone, and apologies for the small delay. My name is Nathan Shapura, political advisor at the European People's Party. And on behalf of the EPP, welcome to the first installment of an exciting new initiative at the EPP, EPP Family Talks. In a time of pandemic, when so many people are struggling physically, psychologically, economically, we are glad to present a new opportunity to bring together those in our political family and beyond. In the coming days and weeks, we will be talking to leaders throughout our political family to hear their perspectives, their ideas, and what they're working on, in particular during this time of crisis. We could not be happier for this first episode to have with us the Secretary General of our party, Antonio Lopez Asturias. In addition to being our Secretary General, he's also a member of the European Parliament uh, and has several different other roles which we will discuss throughout our conversation. Well, Secretary General, thank you so much for being with us. We are very happy to have to have you, and thank you for your support for this new initiative. Yes, thank you, Nathan. Sorry about that. Mouse was not operative. Okay, good. Let's go. I ask you about. <laughs> Not in your capacity. Before I do that, I thought I would be more personal. Uh, one of the things that I think many of us struggle with during this time when we're working from home and we're feeling isolated is just more of a human connection. I wanted to ask you first, how are you and your family coping with this crisis, with this lockdown in a, in a more personal way? What is, what is a typical day like for you? Well, uh, we have uh, the privilege, rare privilege compared with some European countries, including mine, Spain, that here in Brussels, where we live, uh, at least we can go and have a walk in the street or go to the park and um, do jogging or cycling. This is, uh, of course, psychologically very important. Uh, of course, the question is that I'm very, very concerned because in my country, people cannot even cannot even go to the garden of their houses. So is the situation which is in Spain now, right now, happening in the day-to-day -day life. Of course, you know, as now, I have many video conferences. Uh, in my case, political, and uh, also in an effort that we are doing to, to coordinate the efforts uh, of all our member parties in the PP. Uh, those who are in government or in opposition. As we speak right now, this week, the more crucial thing, crucial moment is the uh, Eurogroup with the ministers of finance and uh, the possible help and aid that could come to the most damaged countries, you know, including my own country, Spain. In the day to day, family wise, uh, well, we have the, uh, the, well, we are using a lot Netflix, I guess, like many people. HBO and many other video uh, facilities, a lot of films and series. I'm taking my time also to read a lot, uh, a rare opportunity because usually with my agenda in the day-to-day -day life, the normal life was I didn't have so much time to read, you know, and being at home it gives you the opportunity also uh, for that, you know. Uh, and also on a more personal note, I have discovered, like many, these new telematic communication tools that uh, allows me to speak with friends. And I have to say family members and friends that I have not for a long time spoken to. The people that maybe I only see when I'm in uh, my country and uh, my city in Madrid or in Mallorca, the island where I, use, uh, where I usually go for summer vacations. Well, now I have the uh, opportunity to talk to many of them on a more regular basis than I did in the past. So um, 
maybe maybe we can only have one of the little positive consequences of the situation it's also that i think that for many of us is approaching uh, us more to uh, maybe family members and friends that uh, in the past we didn't have so much hope. There are several things I would like to follow up and ask you uh, after hearing that answer. But one thing I would, would just ask you first is tell us more about the situation in your home country of Spain. And of course, you're very connected at the highest levels with your own party, our member party, Partido Popular, who is not in government now in Spain. And what is the situation at, at a more political level also in Spain right now? Well, uh, unfortunately, the government in Spain was slow to react. But you could say that of many governments. Problem is that we have in Spain a very ideological based government, social communist, a mix of socialist, Sanchez, Pedro Sanchez, uh, the Socialist Party of Spain, and the Communist Party, this new populist communist party of Podemos, now with Pablo Iglesias as vice president. It has proved to be a very, very bad on a coalition government in order to deal with this. I was just praising in an uh, interview, Greeks, because fortunately they changed government from Tsipras, now to Kiriakos Mitsotakis, from the communist Tsipras populist, uh, to now the center right. And no wonder the situation in Greece is much, much more controlled. And it's much more, you know, uh, of course, uh, managed, well managed by the government. In our case, government allowed manifestations for the Women's Right Day Although they had information about the critical situation that we were going to live. But of course, penal and political consequences will come afterwards. What we have to do now, and the opposition party also, by party Partido Popular, we are all working uh, in order to alleviate the sufferings of so many people, so many deaths right now in my country, and so many people affected. Uh, uh, and also, not only now, but afterwards, the economic crisis, the unemployment that is raising now in many countries in Europe, but also specifically in my country, in Spain. These are the things that we are right, right now working uh, in order to uh, help in this uh, from, uh, from my party, from Partido Popular, the leadership, which is very committed, which we have in government and in opposition a long-standing experience of solving problems for the Spanish people. One of the things you mentioned in, in that answer was the fact that the European Union, or at least several member states, as in the past, have been uh, maybe has maybe was slow to start in addressing some of the early elements of this crisis. And I know at a personal level, you're somebody who is very passionate about history. Earlier this afternoon, in an event with the Wilfred Martin Center on geopolitics of the Eastern Mediterranean. You talked about this and, and sort of gave a bird's eye view of what this crisis looks like maybe over the course of the last several decades. How, how would you compare what we're seeing now to previous crises in the European Union? Well, true, I have lived, I will say that, yeah, in the Martin Center event, during my 18 or 19 years tenure as Secretary General, I have seen many European crises. Uh, and I always, I always have seen the same exactly the same steps in this crisis. First, governments of member countries, which are democratically elected by the societies in these countries, usually uh, tend to have these coordinated, chaotic responses to the same crisis. This happened in the financial crisis, this happened with the uh, immigration also crisis, and many others. And the governments tend to be, you know, forget about the European coordination, and then they start to make to take wild solutions uh, that really, at the end, two weeks after, usually it's, it's like this, <laughs> or a month after, they realize that this lack of coordination, this lack of commitment, this lack of networking between governments, and the lack of contact with, with Brussels at the end is affecting everybody. Piece of uh, an example I would like to present is the question of transport. Member states closed the borders of different several member states without announcing this measure to their neighbors, to Brussels, to anyone, and chaotically and uh, started to close borders. 
Then suddenly, a week after, they realized that closing the borders was creating also lines and chaos in distribution of food and medical equipment around Europe. And that is when governments turned to Brussels and they started to speak about solidarity like they always do when they need to be coordinated because they are chaotic by themselves. And this is what happened. It came and then the European Commission very quickly put into operation what we know as the green lanes. It means special lanes for trucks so that you, everybody can have in your supermarkets the food that is now so essential uh, for all millions of European citizens, including, by the way, the United Kingdom, which still is member of the European Union until Brexit finally happens. So today, in the United Kingdom, they have vegetables and fruits coming from Spain, thanks to this coordination and thanks to this Europe. I can only wonder, I can only wonder to think what would have happened in the United Kingdom if Brexit was already a reality in this crisis. So you mentioned when you were discussing the situation in Spain, you mentioned the importance of the Euro group and you've just talked considerably about the transport issue. Our own, uh, one of our own party members uh, from Romania is commissioner for transport. Of course, this is something the commissioner, uh, President von der Leyen has spoken about quite a lot. One of the things you're very involved with is chairing um, meetings of our foreign ministers and, and other formations that we have, meeting with our commissioners, our, our various ministers on all the solutions which are being put on the table. What are some of the other things that you would highlight uh, in the last several weeks that you've seen and that you've heard from our own family members is about the ideas they're putting forward and the, the ways they've already started to bring the European Union out of this crisis? Coordination in the uh, in the now uh, the market is very difficult to buy masks to buy uh, special medical equipment we have to realize the european union was not producing this kind of equipment all this kind of equipment was produced in china or in asiatic countries or india uh, we have to review this in the future we need to know that, and that if for uh, for, for uh, future pandemic crisis that might happen, that this has to be again uh, by the coordination of the European Union, we will have to start to, to start again to have medical enterprises and medical equipment produced in the European Union. Uh, second, the question of repatriation of European citizens. Nearly two hundred thousand European citizens have returned to their houses, to their homes in Europe, thanks to the coordinating efforts of the European Union representing member states with different states outside of the European Union. For example, someone that's been trapped in Malaysia, in Indonesia, could come back to the, uh, to the European Union thanks to the coordination that has been done from Brussels. These are things that I'm telling you that unfortunately you will not read in the newspaper. You will not find in the media, as always, when it's all European news, when it's about positive news, you will not find them. If it's negative news, you will find this in, uh, in all the headlines. But okay, we work like this, we know. And also, the problem, as I said, is now not only as the members of the Eurogroup are doing these days to develop the money in order to alleviate the sufferings uh, of people and to help all the healthcare systems in our countries to overcome this pandemic and this crisis, but also looking into the future. How are we going to cope and how much money we have to dedicate in order also to prepare our countries after this crisis with the reality of a very, very damaged economy? and also with the high unemployment rates that our countries are now showing. We will have to start immediately when the experts tell us the situation is under control. We have to regain trust, not only in European citizens, but also outside. I think that we have to be in the front line in recuperation, economical recuperation, and the European Union has to be the first in this. We have been severely uh, attacked, uh, hit by this uh, crisis. But I think also that we will be the first ones uh, to be out 
Uh, and then we have to immediately reconstruct uh, all the damage that has been done to our economy. I'm not going to go with data about the billions that are now going through several instruments that already existed. There's this discussion about the euro bonds now, and uh, I'm in favor. But I think that also what we have to use is the instruments that we already have, like program sure that already was there in order to mobilize millions of euros to keep people in jobs and uh, businesses running uh, around Europe. I think those positive stories you mentioned is, is really the main reason we wanted to do this initiative of bringing our leaders throughout the political family together to talk indeed about the good work that is being done. It might not be you know, finding its way into the newspaper for whatever reason. But thank you so much for that. I think we're gonna wind down very soon this first episode. But before we do, I wanted to ask you a more personal question from uh, something you said earlier, which is you're doing a lot of reading and watching at Netflix these days. And so I wanted to ask, are there any are there any personal stories which you'd like to highlight about you know some of the ways which actual real people, everyday people might be affected by some of the, the things you've put forward on the table or or what things would you recommend as far as what people could read or Netflix series that you would recommend that they watch um, in such a difficult time? I'm reading a book about the fall of the Roman Republic and the race of the Empire of Augustus. People might tell me what, <laughs> what reading is that. I'm seeing today uh, how the European Union, a democratic, imperfect, imperfect, we are not perfect, slow reacting instrument, but democratic compared with many others, instrument is under siege. From outside and from inside, the European project has always had many enemies. People that do not tolerate how democratically we take decisions. Regimes around us, we all know who we are speaking about. But they are trying now, profiting of the crisis, trying to interfere in, in, it, in the European Union and also with disinformation. I welcome and I congratulate the efforts that the Commission is doing to combat this. Specifically, uh, Commissioner Sinas in the European Commission is doing an outstanding work. But also, Ursula von der Leyen and the whole Commission. Uh, because this is a battle between democracy and uh, authoritarian regimes. And people sometimes, they feel attracted, specific, especially in times of crisis. They feel attracted by this kind of solution. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such magical solution. And we cannot give up our freedoms uh, because of this. We have to respect our democratic, imperfect, of course, always solutions. This way, we will beat coronavirus. And then afterwards, we will be again, as always, enjoying our freedom uh, in this European Union. Uh, food for thought, this question of the Roman Republic, the fall of the Roman Republic, race of the empire, uh, the fascination of and those times, like I see in many people today, for this kind of changing into these regimes, unipersonal regimes where your life is decided by a single person. I refuse to do that. We have to do also our work. We have to accept the critics. We have to change many things in the European Union. The European Union is always in constant evolution. That is proof that all, we know uh, that there's not such perfection. But of course, I would love and I would like to live uh, always in this kind of democratic system. Uh, this is my main <laughs> reading and why I'm doing so these days. Well, Secretary General Tono, thank you so much for those thoughts. Thank you for your time and for your support for this initiative. And thank you for the work that you're doing uh, and the leadership that you're showing right now at, at such a difficult time for Europe. The one part is from inside the European Union, 82 also from all, all around us, very good friends that I'm in constant contact with, people, politicians that are an example and that they are trying with anonymity, without any publicity, trying right now to overcome the crisis in their countries. 
Of course, again, they are not perfect. They don't have magical solutions. They are doing their best. In some cases, you know, they are being they, they are doing things right, others wrong. But at the end of this story, we will make also a good a good code of management for future crises. And this is how, at the end, the European Union has been uh, reacting and built. We learned from our mistakes. We learn from uh, uh, the critics, and we take out of them the best to continue with this project, where everybody together we have a chance in this uh, globalized world. Alone, my country, Spain, Germany, even Finland, Greece, will never survive this globalized world. Let's do it together, and let's uh, trust that there are now the experts in health also experts in economy and so on, working around the clock. So, you know, uh, we could alleviate some, we could provide some also help and alleviation to the sufferance of so many people around the European Union. My final comment is for those who lost friends, family members in this crisis, in this video, because of the epidemic, and uh, we have all we have all suffered, of course, uh, the effects, members of our family. And uh, I hope that in the next future, uh, we can avoid all this uh, in this coordinate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tono. That's, uh, I think, a very fitting way to end this first episode of EPP Family Talks. Tune in next time for our next episode next week. And for all of those celebrating Easter, we wish you a very safe and happy weekend. Thank you very much.